behalf of the uh, Springfield Garden Club and the Springfield Town Library, we're thrilled to have our speaker here today, as you are too, I'm sure, because you're here. So uh, first I'm going to introduce Jean Swanson, who is the head of the, uh, no, she's not, but she's involved with it. <laughs> she has something to do with the Springfield Garden Club. Yay! because I do publicity, so um, past president, but no, no longer. Clearly you're um, doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I knew it was a good team. Um, but I just thought I'd take five minutes. I know you didn't come here to hear about Garden Club, but I thought I'd take five quick minutes to tell you a little bit about what you may not know about Garden Club. Everyone knows that we do the plantings downtown, around town. Um, we have 80 members, and there's been a club in Springfield since about 1915. Um, so over 100 years, which is exciting. Um, and we, our records only go back to the 40s, so uh, we've been keeping records since then. Um, but our, members, our operating costs are really low, and our membership dues cover our operating costs. So any and all donations go directly back to the community, to programs in the community, which is we feel really good about that. So some of the things um, that you may not know, five quick things, um, we do the downtown plantings. We also do Eureka Schoolhouse out um, on, the, on the way of the interstate. And at this end of town, we do the um, Route 106, um, the traffic island out on 106. Amen. So we do that, uh, that planting. Um, and we do scholarships. We do $2,000 of scholarships for um, graduating high school seniors that are in forestry, uh, environmental science, or um, one of the horticulture. Um, we also do arrangements for Meals on Wheels once a month. Um, we do that the first week, week of the month. Um, we do little arrangements and they are really happily received by those people. Um, we also do plantings at the Adult Daycare Center in downtown Springfield um, for seniors. Um, we, do, we do actually um, climbing vines and veggies and things they can eat like cherry tomatoes and things like that. Um, and they are really well received. We have pictures out on the table out there. Um, we do a junior gardening program. For the last four years, we've been working with the uh, third graders at Union Street School. We did a design and um, worked with them to do a pollinator garden, butterfly garden. So that's really exciting because every year the class changes over. So there's always new third graders. There's actually four classes, there's 90 students. So the last thing I want to talk about is the Iron Bridge Memorial Garden. It's down on the way out to the interstate, the Iron Bridge. Um, we have a paver project there. And um, we, people have <coughs> bought pavers in memory of uh, loved ones or in honor of loved ones, um, past or present. Um, there's a paper there from Charles Lindbergh. So um, it, you can find all this information on our website if you have any interest at all. Um, so please join us after for some coffee and some snacks, and I'm going to turn it back to Connie. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's wonderful to see. I'm new to Springfield, and it's so wonderful to see so many people involved in all these different projects by all the different groups going on. And tonight, we have wonderful speaker, Dan Snow, who is, as most of you clearly know, uh, an amazing artist with stones and doing out in nature and walls and all sorts of uh, balancing amazing things. And he is a, you may not know this, he is a master craftsman with the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain and the Dry Stone Conservation. Sounds pretty cool to me. He's been doing it for 40 years in the US, the UK, and Scandinavia. And we're just really lucky to have him here tonight. We want to really thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Thanks, Jean. Maybe you've come uh, to hear me tonight, but then again, there's a really good looking table full of treats in here and coffee later. So, uh, if I'm a disappointment, that won't be. <laughs> I read recently that um, Vermont ranks third in the nation for artists as a percentage of the workforce. How many of us are artists? 
sure. <laughs> I think we're. I think we had about uh, at least eight percent of uh, of us raising a hand here, and I think that's representative of how much art means to our communities and how strong it is as a driving force in our economy as well. Personally, uh, I'm an artist, but you won't find my work in a gallery. Uh, it's not the kind of work that gets done uh, in advance of being sold. It, uh, in other words, I don't have a studio where I make my art and then find uh, customers. I have to find a customer first because the work I do is in the landscape. It's for um, commercial, uh, for co colleges, um, it's for private individuals, whoever it is that commissions me to do a work. It's their land, their space that dictates what can happen for the work that I do. To get started, I just uh, want to at least have everyone get a glimpse of something bright and colorful because <laughs> stone is kind of muted. Uh, it's often not even noticed in the landscape because we're so used to seeing it. It doesn't jump out at you uh, the way a, a forest of peonies like this at my neighbors might. I've been uh, recently in Scandinavia, and unlike most of the trips I've made there where I've had a commission, this time my wife Ellen and I were there, uh, invitation to artist residencies, and it was a situation where, well, uh, you're here, what can you do? Uh, it was uh, a fun challenge to see what I could do in their environment over a short period of time. And unlike most of the work I do, which is rather large scale, things I was able to do were, were quite small. And because it's such a beautiful landscape already, it's difficult to think about anything that would improve on it. In the case here, I look for a scar on the landscape, which was where gravel had been dumped for uh, some road improvements. So it's taking that as a starting place to make something, uh, a quick idea of turning, turning it into a labyrinth. The images I'll be showing are work that I've done at different times, most of it recent. In Finland, there was nothing to work with except what I could uh, come up with in the wilderness. So I found a lot of sticks, some with moss on them, and uh, had some fun making some small scale objects. Placed in an environment, they, in a photograph, they begin to take on uh, a larger scale than their reality might suggest. For instance, this one is about that large. <laughs> Recently installing a work that is not dry stone construction, I've made an attempt at making sculpture that is with stone, but using it as adhesive. This is something that I worked on over the winter in our uh, sugar house woodshed. Here I have a table with slate chips, a hammer, a spinning, um, piece that helped me help guide the shape I was making. Oh. I'll be throwing in a, a few things that come to mind to me uh, and uh, I thought you might enjoy having them to think about as we go along. So once the adhesive had cured, my friends Archie and Archie Clark came and helped me move it. Oh, 
does it stay together? It's just dry. Well, it's it is not just yeah. dry. In this case, it's uh, the use of adhesive. Oh, for okay. every stone has a dab of adhesive on it. Well, it was on a, um, a stone platform. There's a metal rod connecting the two. What kind of stone? It's what slate. Colors? It's slate from um, the western side of the state. It's say red and green slate. Really? Hmm. I like to think of this as uh, either chaos into order or order into chaos. <laughs> What I'm doing in a project is examining the location and looking for materials. Any artists need space and they need materials. Sometimes what I find is not something that is ready to go. And here I found a very large slab of granite on the property, drilled and split it into bars transported them out of the woods, set up a base to lay them up on, and the finished work. It's a, a quick little uh, stop, uh, fast action film of the creation of it here. <laughs> Much of what I do with equipment is a front end loader. I have a couple of those and a dump truck and that's my main working materials for uh, equipment. And then when I need something heavier duty, I'm looking for the help of friends with bigger machines. When someone asks me to look at their property and they have often an idea of a location for something and maybe hopefully nothing too specific so that I can absorb what their property is, uh, have a look at what their material selection is and combine those two into an idea. In this case, using a a clay model, I was able to suggest an idea for a construction. And this is in um, Cornwall, Vermont. Many times I've rebuilt uh, existing stone walls and what uh, I get to do for the fun part sometimes is at the end of the walls, one end or the other, to be able to say, well, this can be completed in a very traditional manner, or maybe there's something a little different that can be added. And the one on the left, an old field wall was rebuilt, and at the end of it, it became kind of a, a walking, um, elevated walkway from a big boulder to a pier to the wall end. And here a wall turns into a fire pit patio. And although you can't see the wall that's attached to the far one there, that was a pretty dramatic end to an old stone wall. A couple of years ago, Landmark College in Putney uh, asked me to make something as a feature on their quad. And because their mascot is a shark, that became a starting point for an idea for a design. So from actually a, a piece of internet art going to a three-dimensional model, and then transferring that onto the ground to be able to 
cut out the soil and put in a crushed stone base. In the case of Landmark College, there was no stone available there. I found a, a quarry in uh, Fitzwilliam, New Hampshire that doesn't make uh, any new granite, but they have lots of slag that they're selling. So going there and getting a few truckloads of granite became the impetus for making the shapes. I'm slowly getting from symmetrical designs to asymmetrical designs, something that my sculpture teacher in college encouraged me to do many years ago. Uh, something about symmetry is very safe, stable, but in fact, for something to have energy and to move, it's best if it's asymmetrical. The idea for the planting medium for this was to build a bag of soil basically on top of the sculpture. That's what you see here with the very uh, open weave burlap. So well, that will allow plants to grow through it, but the soil will maintain its shape as long as it takes for the plants to take. So last summer they got some plants in and the irrigation on and hopefully this summer things will really spread out and it will become a, a green surface that's inviting for students and faculty and visitors to walk on, climb on, relax on. What are the plants there? It's a creeping thyme. Creeping thyme. <laughs> I was asked to be a kind of clerk of the works for an artist in Connecticut a few years ago who had a property that was uh, littered with very large stones and the idea from him was to take advantage of them in as many ways as possible. So every day it was uh, putting some big equipment to work and making a variety of arrangements. There are over a hundred of these on the property now. That's in Woodbury, Connecticut. Is that a private situation? Yes, it's, it's, it is open once a summer to the public. Uh, Edward Tufty is the artist and if you um, look up uh, his name and Hogpen Hill Farm, I think that's, uh, that will get you to something that would um, find a, a date for the open house. It's, it's quite dramatic. It's, it's a very interesting place. Besides those objects, he has made many large scale uh, works mostly in steel. Some of the pieces of stone that uh, a landowner finds and feels is worthy of making something special out of, uh, in this case, an old uh, well cover. So the hope was to elevate it, uh, show it off, and do it in a way that as much is visible as possible. So here I used four granite posts, made a sandwich with the well cap uh, on the ground and had a piece of equipment lifted into place. Also on that property, uh, this is in western Massachusetts, a well, uh, not exactly a well, more like a spring that was a wet spot on a hillside that uh, the clients 
girls really enjoyed playing in, but uh, basically it was just a mud hole. So we dug it out and created this uh, little grotto. I like water features with stone. It's, I find, very difficult to create artificial water spaces that are successful. So if it's possible to find a wet place and uh, take advantage of that, it may only be seasonal, but when it's operating, it's operating as nature intended it. Many times we'll look for examples of stonework in our environment and ask ourselves, uh, what was that? Why was it there? What's, what's its purpose? Um, oftentimes it was related to agriculture, sometimes uh, animal enclosures. These examples, uh, this is here in Springfield, along with this smaller raised bed enclosure, and this piece for a couple who want to have sheep someday. They thought, well, let's get a, a sheep fold. If we have that, then there's a better chance we'll get some sheep. <laughs> I'll probably talk about some different styles of building with stone that are traditional, this being a very common look, perhaps uh, more regular than we see in the landscape, but much of what we're looking at now has had uh, many years of dereliction and originally may have been as cleanly formed as this example. Stones with their length used toward the center of the wall, covering the joint of the two stones below it. The wall face tilted in as it rises, and the center of it t packed tightly. Then from that basic understanding of what makes a wall that's dry laid hold together. There are many varieties. This is close to what might be considered a Galloway wall if you're in Scotland from the southwest part of Scotland where they often start with a small stone on the bottom, halfway up move to a single stone width until they reach the top. Sometimes the models I've made have been with actual stone. It's, it's fun to uh, make a little ad adhesive held together stone construction as a way to imagine something on a larger scale. In this case, after trying a couple different ideas for a place to keep compost piles, this was the uh, idea that we came up with as a, just a two bay enclosure. And while I was working on it, a friend from Scotland, Dave Goulder, came and helped me out for a couple days. No, he didn't really roll it up that plank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he wanted that picture to take home with him. <clears throat> see if he could uh, convince his friends that uh, he was still moving stones like that up, up ramps, and, and which is something that he has done for many years, but not so much lately. So the double-walled, uh, double-faced wall for the bottom portion, and then the single stones on top of that. If you've been to the Montshire Museum in the last couple of years, you've seen a new entrance area inspired by a drop of uh, water or rain hitting the surface of uh, a pond, for instance, and splashing. So the idea 
for the entrance area was to make something that people could both enjoy looking at and also be part of by walking and sitting on it. After the meetings take place, <laughs> everyone leaves me alone. So here's a little clay model that helped describe what my plan was. I don't recommend taking on projects that are 90% blow your ankles. <laughs> uh, well, if you're gardeners, you probably don't mind that, but uh, I like to eventually get up to a place in a construction that I can unbend my back. This was a couple months of not much uh, straightening my back out. The finished work combined stainless steel as a uh, sort of sitting rings on top of the stonework and also stainless steel extensions of those splashes. And that work was done by two different metal fabricators. <laughs> Another enclosure, this time trying to find almost a symbol for what it represented as a place. In this case, it was for a vegetable garden. So taking the shape of a pumpkin seed, taking dimensions off of it, transferring those dimensions to the ground, putting in a crushed stone base and adding the planting medium in advance of the work at the center. And then outlining that uh, shape on the crushed stone to have a guide to begin the work. I think in the background here, you can see some piles of stone. They were all collected from the property. Well, that all was moved with the loader into the site, hand building up to that first level, and then the larger stones set with a chain and the, the, the bucket. That was one of those, well, I'm here and it's cold, but I'd be skiing if I wasn't here, so it's not too cold to be outside. I don't really have an excuse not to keep going. So mostly it was built in the winter. Where was that pumpkin seed? Uh, that's in Harrisville, New Hampshire. And then jumping across the pond to Denmark, being invited to make a piece for an environmental art park. That little sketch in clay was how I envisioned the feel of what would be created. Really uh, a network of walls that created a lot of uh, four, five, three-sided cells. A beautiful old uh, arboretum, really, on the grounds of a castle that has uh, a couple dozen pieces of environmental art in it and paths to get around them to them. And back in Vermont for a commission to make 
Oh, well, it's really, uh, in the simplest form, it's the walls of a private cemetery. The property was and is where the uh, landowner has workhorses. So looking at a horse, I thought, what part of a horse might inspire a work? And I was uh, intrigued with a uh, horse's eyes. So I made a clay model of that portion of the horse head, had those, uh, that shape digitally realized by providing me with points in space six, six inches apart. So one of my uh, clients I'd never met because she had passed away a year before and was buried in the field to prepare a site for her husband. Uh, we put a, a sand pit next to her and then built the enclosure around them or around her and his eventual resting place. Well, now it's a, almost a, a, a pocket garden with access through a, a chambered pathway. The style of construction is a little bit like the ripple effect at the Manchai Museum in that the upper portion is all stone set on edge. This is not chronological. I sort of picked these projects, put them in a random order, and then Ellen found the date that they were done. So if it seems like we're not going anywhere or getting anywhere. That's the reason why. Uh, invited to make a temporary piece at a, uh, outside of a museum in Kerava, Finland, a few years back. First thing was, well, who's got some stone? There was a uh, gravel pit with uh, screened material, some wonderful granite cobbles. Well, they delivered a, a big truckload of uh, cobbles. And at the end of the project, end of the summer when it was removed, they just came back, loaded up their cobbles, and took them back to their gravel pit. But in the meantime, this shape was created out in front of the museum. And that was temporary, you said? It was a temporary project, yeah. And uh, also part of uh, my job was to find a way to include art students in the production. So I had to pick something that I could instruct uh, a half a dozen young people in handwork to be able to accomplish it. So a couple days a week uh, they came while I was working on it and did a fair portion of the actual construction. How long did that take to build? Uh, three, four weeks. Uh, kind of the opposite of uh, something temporary would be something that had a foundation that was as permanent as this piece of ledge outcrop. Really uh, finding f four spots on the ledge that I could start a, a small footprint for some legs and without a clear picture in my mind where it was going. I just knew that if I started the legs close enough together, eventually I'd get them to meet. Just a, a kind of a fun feature. 
to look out the window and watch the snow uh, build on. Uh, it feels a little bit like a tree stump to me. Well, for the last uh, few years, mostly in the winter months, I've been working in Harrisville, New Hampshire, uh, sort of rebuilding old field walls, but uh, more getting them out of the woods and more into the edge of the field than rather than rebuilding right where they were, where the forest had taken them over, moving them out where they become part of the uh, visible landscape. Also much easier to build uh, if you don't have trees to work around. So hundreds of yards of wall and this particular style of wall would be called a, a, a single and what it is in the winter is a snow fence. So the um, holes that are through that single stack of stone allow the wind which comes out of the uh, northwest. The next thing you see from this hilltop is Mount Snow in Vermont. So it's a lot of area for the wind to build up here. And the uh, sculpted snow that accumulates on the leeward side of the wall is as sculptural as anything I have ever made. Mostly with this particular construction, I was using an excavator with a thumb, which allowed me to really build the bottom two thirds of it without lifting anything. It's a kind of a rough construction, but the idea is to start with the biggest ones at the bottom and working up to the smallest ones on the top. So it's somewhat triangular in cross section. Uh, and that principle of putting a stone over a joint, trying to accomplish that as often as possible so that any individual stone's weight is pressing across the length of the wall by sitting on two stones rather than its weight going directly to the ground under it. It helps to knit it all together. It's also a very simple construction to repair. If it does fail uh, in any one area, all you're having to repair is a line of stone rather than uh, a wall's worth of stone. I was really hoping to have something that felt like someone had planted an old millstone in their yard with this construction. So I needed a, a hole through it. I knew that much. I needed to be round. Uh, I wanted to make it out of large slabs of stone and set it at, a, at an angle. So it was uh, quite a balancing act in the process of building it. I probably, well I know, I overreached. Um, that outside ring, you're going to see it again in a second here, but it, it won't be where it is there. <laughs> uh, because a couple years later, after the snow had rested on it, it had distorted to the extent that the client wasn't happy with it, which is fine, and I agreed that it was a good thing to do something different. So I rescued those outside ring stones and used them for the starting point of a new, new sculpture. A shape that's uh, much less precarious. Yeah, happy with that one. <laughs> 
the time frame of? Uh, I think that was probably three days. Yeah. yeah, I think I took a picture every day. I have uh, three days worth of uh, photographs of the progress on it. I probably wouldn't have thought of making that shape if I hadn't been forced to by my mistake. Uh, I think this is probably the project that is, I think, uh, most fantastic in not so much its ex execution, but in uh, how it came about and well, it was for uh, a whiskey distillery in Scotland. So what better client could there be? <laughs> they, uh, on their property, there was a Pictish carved stone that was removed and uh, now is at the uh, National Museum in Edinburgh. But, um, the distillery a few years back commissioned a stone carver to recreate it in its uh, location of the original. And this is something that's very meaningful to the Glen Morangie distillery. So it, it became a, an obvious starting point for me in coming up with a design. So really what I did was take a section of this particular design think about it more three-dimensionally and this next image is going to look like the same as this but uh, imagine that you're in a drone a uh, hundred feet above it So that's the finished work and that's me standing on it. <laughs> Here's uh, the, the clay model digitally uh, placed in the, uh, the location that we had talked about uh, constructing it. Well, by the time of the advertising agency that uh, really was in charge of this whole thing got through with it, it, it got flipped upside down and moved to the other side. <laughs> so uh, I, I felt like, well, I'm here to make something. Whatever it takes for me to get started, I'm happy with. Now, there's nothing more customary in Scotland than uh, dry stained dikes. But uh, for me to make an artwork there, if it just looked like every stone wall that's there, it would kind of miss the point. So my task was really to come up with something that took the traditions employed by Dreistein Dikers forever, <laughs> for a very long time, and implement them, employ them in a new form. As a uh, more than lucky to be wandering around the property and discover a pretty well-concealed pile of stones. Now, as I tore the pile apart, I realized that it was a complete gold mine. It was almost everything I needed to complete the work. And it was only about uh, 200 yards away. Well, the, um, Soil was removed, crushed stone was put in place, the outline was painted on the crushed stone. Batter boards, that's the wooden frameworks, were set in place to help um, guide the batter of the wall, the slope of the faces. So one uh, kind of bag full of stone at a time was brought in through the opening to this old walled garden.
right by the sea and uh, north of Inverness on the east coast. Uh, uh, just the most beautiful setting. Very fortunate for Ellen and I to spend, I guess we're there three months altogether. Yeah. I'm only 49% of the business. Uh, we work together and uh, Ellen is uh, the person that actually makes it a business. The organization that I'm capable of really involves uh, big heavy objects. But in terms of everything else that it takes to coordinate with uh, clients, to uh, have a, a, a show, social media presence, Ellen is responsible for and does a wonderful job for us. Sometimes the best way to show someone what will be done is to build it just uh, temporarily, you'd say, uh, as an, the real thing is the example of what can be built. And here I made an arrangement of slabs of stone uh, that cr created some seating and some climbing spaces that went at the Brattleboro Museum and Art Center's garden. So it becomes a place for uh, sitting around, having lunch, looking out at the river. Really the, the best thing for me, besides getting to make something, is to see individuals, families, groups, uh, any collection of folks that find what I've done and make it their own by engaging the space that it's in. Uh, I can completely retreat from what that object is when others adopt it. So until it becomes someone else's, I don't think it's really finished. And I'm very pleased to see things used in whatever way they are. One of the nice things about making something in the environment is that you have no control over how people experience it, uh, what it becomes to them, what it means to them. So they imbue it with a story of their own. This is the, the last image, and it is from uh, Brattleboro's Living Memorial Park, uh, one of the earlier projects that I was commissioned to do by the Softball Association to create uh, seating behind home plate. standing way back there didn't oh. see it too well, but it was great. The one thing that I kept thinking of as I was watching was the term practical magic. It just seems so magical and yet practical at the same uh -huh. time. Yeah. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming, and I forgot to thank the Friends of the Springfield Town Library for also being sponsors of this. Um, there are uh, books down there to purchase. And Dan is available to sign them. And then there are treats in here. And um, we want to thank Dan. Thank you very much. That oh, was sure. wonderful. Thank you. I'm going to hang around if there are questions. Question. Yeah? Um, there's a tendency of people to go into a stream bed and mount locks on top of one another. And I was wondering what your opinion of that is. Yeah, a uh, question about uh, rock stacking in natural places. Um, I, it used to really burn me. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I finally let it go. Uh, just, just uh, people enjoy handling stone. I understand that. The only thing I would suggest, if any of you are going to a place that you think is beautiful and you want to engage it physically, stacking some rocks, have a great time. Photograph it, return the stone to its uh, origins, uh, and, and walk away from it. Because no one else coming there, I don't, I don't think will enjoy it as much as you did making it. So uh, give them a, a, a clean slate. One more question. <laughs> the historical society, do they have any control over the stone walls that proliferate uh, the state? Historical societies? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 these stone walls are all over from, from the uh, uh, sheet that we're running. And, and I just wondered if if you're allowed, you seem to go in and, and harvest your stones here and there. I just wondered if there, there's any control over over, over the, that action. Um, I'm not aware of any anything specific to any historical societies. I think there are laws related to people's boundaries and not disturbing <laughs> what is uh, the description of a boundary between properties. I think within your own property, there's, unless something is designated specifically as a, a landmark of some kind, I don't know that there are any restrictions at all. I've never uh, I heard of any. Stone out of state park, so is I would imagine that to be true. Yes. Yeah. yeah I I've not ever attempted that, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Is your design work collaborative with the owner of the property, or is it strictly between you and nature? Oh, well, I'd say that I'm beholding to the client, the, the landowner, the uh, the people who love their property enough to ask me to come and do something. So most often what I'm attempting to do is offer them a design that I think I can build and if it's with their materials then it's limited to that, that they're going to find uh, enjoyable. And it is a uh, a risk for them because they, it's a little different than a painting on the wall where you say, okay, I like that painting, I think I'll buy it. You're really agreeing to collaborate on something uh, with someone who you're putting your trust in. So uh, I, I can't do it without them and I want customers to be happy with the results. I've gotten better at recognizing a time when, for whatever reasons, our, our ideas don't mesh, and I'm perfectly happy to say uh, this is not a project that I'll be taking on. So that's, that's my way of regulating, uh, controlling a little bit what I do. And of course, landowners have the same privilege. They can say, thanks for your idea, but we don't want to do this. I'm going to stick around so if individually if you have questions or anything at all, let me know and uh, we'll chat. One more question? Yeah, you mentioned a couple times using adhesives for the stone. What is that? What are you using? Well, yes, that the first slate bobble, uh, the adhesive that I use is called Lexel, L-E-X-E-L. Comes in 10 inch tube, it's caulking gun type of tube. Uh, it takes at least two weeks to cure fully. It's waterproof. Uh, you can, it will adhere to wet surfaces. Um, the only thing that's difficult with it is whatever the chemicals that it's made out of, they outgas something horrible. So it's not a good product to use in an enclosed space. So whenever I've used it, I've been using it outdoors basically uh, or under a shelter. 
But uh, I have some little models that I've made that are probably 25 years old that have been sitting out around my house. And that stuff <laughs> it holds. It just, nothing has come loose. So if you want to try something like that, I can recommend that as, a, as an adhesive for outdoor stonework. How is your back? Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking that my back is my best part. <laughs> a lot of other things are, are failing up, but uh, I think probably in my 30s I had some back troubles, but I found my way out of them, and since then I've uh, managed to avoid back trouble. <laughs> oh, I want to tell a little story. Oh, okay. Uh, my friend and I were in Newfoundland, and we went to a little town called English Harbor. Oh, no. <laughs> and there were like 27 people that lived there. It was last May to see the oh, icebergs. And this man that was kind of riding around in a 4x4 four four was oh. there. And he said, where are you from? And I'm from New Hampshire, and my boyfriend's from Vermont. And he goes, Vermont? Because we were admiring all the stone there. And he goes, well, this guy from Vermont came. And my friend is Paul Brune, and he goes, oh, I know Dan. So we uh, sat in that little area and had a picture taken. Uh -huh. So it was a small world. You go that's to wild. That's, that's way out there. Yeah, so the boat that you have. Up yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Those five years worth of environmental art workshops. Uh, yes. uh, we're there for, I guess, a month every summer for five years mm -hmm. with uh, the uh, English Harbor Arts Center and left a, a lot of wonderful, crazy things all around there. Uh, the fact <laughs> that you found them and you oh. found yourself here, <laughs> that's a good story. <laughs> oh. Thanks a lot.